Well, thank you all so much. I, I already I felt so welcome here. Good morning, Mountain West Church. I'm so excited to be here. Always feel like this is an extension of our church in Augusta, where Pastor Mo used to be a pastor there. And so we love you guys. I'm so glad to be with you. My husband, Dave, many of you know if you went to our marriage night, he's also preached here before. He's super jealous. He's watching online, but he could not come this morning. But it's for a good reason. Our oldest son, Cooper, just graduated high school on Friday. We celebrated yesterday with family, and he's going to be a Georgia Bulldog this fall. We are so excited. Yes, so excited. And he's our firstborn, first time doing all this, so it's been a whirlwind, but it's so exciting. So that's why the whole fam's not with me. But I did bring one son over here, Connor, and I'm excited to have him in the room with you guys. And I was telling him how special you guys are, and he's already experiencing it. So thank you all so much for giving us such a warm welcome. Just to tell you a little bit more about my family, I have a picture that I brought. Since I can't bring, I call them my five guys. And yes, we do like five guys, burgers and fries. It is my favorite place. But here's a picture of the fam. And so there's my handsome husband, Dave. Uh, and then I have four boys, as you can see, ranging in ages from eight to 18. And their names are Cooper, Connor, Chandler, Chatham. And then we have a dog, Chi Chi. So my friend, I know it's ridiculous. I know. A friend of ours pointed out, she said, you have the Cocos and the Cha Chas. And that was before we had the Chi Chi. So like, we really have a theme going. I trip over their names on the daily, but they know who, they know who I'm talking to. And so <laughs> it's a lot of fun at our house. I'm actually, I'm going to talk to you guys this morning about peace, okay? And years ago, I set out on a quest to discover what does God's peace really mean? Because right when I was in the thick of, I wrote a book about it called Peace Pirates, if you'd like to check it out. But right in the thick, of, as I was writing this book, it's before covid and I was really in the thick of, of, of raising young kids. And kind of, I approached it from the perspective of kind of in my, my life as a mom, as a wife, as a worker, as a friend, as a daughter. Like, how do I have peace when life can be so hard sometimes? Because back then, I kind of understood peace as like silence, okay? And I know a lot of you parents in the room, like they just said, it's summertime now. You're going to have kids at home more. And like we crave silence, but we know it's very elusive, right? And I used to think if I could just have a quiet moment as a mom, maybe I could have some peace. And there was one morning years ago, it was a Saturday morning. Dave and I were doing laundry together, like folding towels. We got all the kids set up, kind of doing, you know, I think the older two were playing video games. The younger two had like Legos and little things they were doing. And anyway, so we get talking, Dave and I are folding towels and talking. And I'm telling you, having a nice talk where it's kind of quieter, right, with your spouse is kind of blissful. And so I think we got carried away. And we were really having a great conversation, folding the towels. And all of a sudden, I realized it's way too quiet, okay? Because I had been a parent for a while by then, and I realized, like, silence is not the goal because silence means something bad's happened, right? And so all of a sudden, like, my heart sinks, and I'm like, okay, let me, let me like, make sure I know where all the kids are. And so we're like, okay, there, there's Chandler. Okay, Cooper and Connor, where are you? Are you playing your game still? Yeah, we're good, Mom. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, no, our youngest, who at the time was, like, two, okay, two. He had been playing with his little, I think, cars, and there was, like, all different kinds of toys kind of on the floor, and he wasn't there. And so literally, I'm like, oh my gosh. So we all start yelling, Chatham, Chatham, where are you? Where are you? And everybody's like, you know, it's go time. We're all trying to find him. And then all of a sudden, I look at our kitchen, and we had a half bath off of our kitchen in that particular house. And I see light in there, and I thought, oh my gosh. Number four is actually using the potty. Like, potty training is going to be easier with him. Like, we'd been working on it, and somehow he turned on the light. Like, it's not making logical sense. But I'm like, okay. Let me go see what he's doing in there. So I go over, and there, to my joy and delight, is my precious little two-year-old. And I mean, I, you know, as a parent, you have that panic, even if it's a few minutes. And so I finally felt relief. But then, to my curiosity, I was like, okay, I'm so glad he's safe. I'm so glad I know where he is. But what is this black stuff on his mouth? Yeah, yeah, okay. And he's just toothy grin, and he's got black stuff like all over his mouth. So, of course, I start scanning him, and I see in his precious little hand, there is a sopping wet Oreo, okay? Not even sure where, like, I didn't even know we had Oreos, okay? So I'm like, where was under the couch? Like, what was this? Sopping wet Oreo that he has been dipping in the toilet. He proceeds to dip it. Yeah, you didn't know it was going there. I know, I know. Dipping it in the toilet. And then he eats it. And literally, Dave and I are like, no. We run to him. And I sweep him up because he's real proud of himself, okay? And, and we're like, I don't know about you, a house with four boys, 
people rarely flush a toilet. So I'm not even trying to see what's in there. Okay. I'm like, I'm literally like, Ugh, you know, and so Dave and I sweep him up. I think I gagged him. Cause I was like, I don't know what's on there. And then we're washing him off. And it's like, all of a sudden we're fine. We can laugh about it now. But in that moment, I thought, man, that, there's no peace in that moment. Right. <laughs> no peace in your toddler dipping an Oreo in the toilet and eating it. Right. And, and we can laugh about that now. And he's just fine. He probably just built some antibodies. That's at least what I'm going to tell myself. I tell myself that a lot with a lot of situations, but you know, I know a lot of us in this room, you know, that that's a little moment of panic that turned out kind of funny, but I know for so many of us in this room, like you came to church this morning, those of you watching online, those of you outside these doors, you came to watch this this morning and, and you're thinking, man, Ashley, that, that was kind of a funny, you know, lack of peace moment, but really I haven't had peace in my life in a long time. Like, I don't even know if I can have peace. I think many, many times we tell ourselves in those long seasons of hardship and frustration and just where you feel like things are topsy-turvy, we often tell ourselves things like, well, once I can pay off those things, once I have the money to do that, then I'll have peace. Or once my spouse stops doing this or starts doing this, then I'll have peace. Or once, you know, I get this job that I've always wanted, then I'll finally have peace. Or once that wayward child finally comes home and starts, you know, going down the straight and narrow, then I'll have peace. Or once I get over this sickness, then I'll have peace. And the list goes on and on and on. We all tend to do this because I think as a culture, all around the world, we tend to think about peace as simply the lack of chaos. We tend to think about peace as calm circumstances as opposed to hard or difficult circumstances. And you know, all those years ago when I was really trying to dive deep into finding out what is God's peace, like what does it really mean? The more I read the word, the more I found out that we truly, as a culture, misunderstand what peace is. Because first and foremost, we need to understand and recognize that, that peace is something that God himself created. Like it was his idea. And it's something that he wants us to have as followers of Christ. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and there's many verses I could share with you today, but one of my favorite that I want to start out with is Proverbs 14.30, and it says this, a heart at peace gives life to the body. You know, when we feel like we have peace in our life and our heart is at peace, don't we feel like we could do just about anything that we could get through just about any circumstance? It's like, you know, whatever comes my way, I'm still going to get through it, like, because we're at peace. And God wants us to be at peace. And there's many more verses that we can share, you know, that we can talk about today about peace. But one big thing we need to understand when it comes to all the verses about peace, I saw this common theme throughout. And I think that we need to understand that God's peace is not the absence of chaos, but it's the presence of our creator. So it's not the absence of something that defines God's peace, but it's all about his presence. And so when we shift our thinking about peace and stop waiting for these different calm circumstances to come and for our chaotic circumstances to go and realize that it's all about him and not about what's happening right down here on earth, right? When it comes to peace, it really, it really changes our perspective. You know, I love how in the New Testament, uh, we see, you know, peace is talked about in both the Old and the New Testament and Jesus himself talked about peace quite a bit as well. And there's a lot of verses I could share, but I love John 14, 27. It says this, this is Jesus speaking. He says, peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You know, I love it that when this was recorded and who Jesus was speaking to, he knew that those human beings, because he, he experienced what it's like. You know, I think sometimes we forget, like he lived on this earth. He knows. He knows we're prone to being afraid. He knows we're prone to not understanding what peace really is. And, you know, God's peace, one of my other favorite verses, is it says that his peace is the kind of peace that surpasses understanding. That's the kind of peace our God gives. Because an unbelieving world will look at us as Christian believers when we have peace in the midst of hard circumstances, not after the hard circumstances, but in the midst of the hard circumstances. When we have peace, an unbelieving world looks at us and thinks that doesn't make sense, but it's not supposed to make sense to them 
because it's peace that surpasses our human understanding. It's a supernatural kind of peace. It's an eternal kind of peace that no one can take away from us, especially when we understand what it really is. And I love that. And to me, that's good news because it means I don't have to wait for it, that it's right there for the taking. But there are things I need to do in order to have more peace in my life. And there's things you can do to have more peace in your life. You know, I didn't want to leave it there. I wanted to really dive deep into, okay, I know that the Old Testament was Hebrew. And when they translated the Hebrew words to English words, a lot of times there's not just one English word that can capture the full meaning of the Hebrew word. And when it comes to peace, it's no different. The Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom. Many of you may have heard that before. If you've ever gone to Israel, you may have heard them greet you by saying shalom. They don't just say hello, but they say shalom, which basically means, you know, have God's peace, which I think is so beautiful. And it's something they very highly value, this concept of shalom. And so when I was looking up shalom, the Hebrew word for peace, I wanted to see that full definition. Like what are some other English words that really give me a clearer picture of what God's peace is? And I found that the word wholeness is something and how they, they translate God's peace, shalom. And I love that because, again, it goes back to that verse that a heart at peace gives life to the body. A heart at peace makes us feel whole. Another definition is it means lacking nothing. So that when we have God's peace, his presence in our life, we lack nothing, no matter what we're facing. And I love that. In fact, I would challenge you to take verses where it has peace and replace that word with wholeness and see how it changes the meaning of that verse. It gives a clearer picture of what God's peace really means. So I'm studying, you know, what the Hebrew word for, for peace is, and I'm really learning about shalom, but I wanted to take it a step further. And I thought, you know, I wonder how the early Hebrews, like the ancient Hebrews, wrote the word shalom to each other, because I know it's an important word. I know it's all throughout the Old Testament, and it's in the New Testament. But how did the ancient Hebrews write this word shalom to each other? And what I discovered was that there is actually an ancient Hebrew lexicon that is really word pictures. They're symbols that capture the essence of a word, very similar to like ancient, um, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It's very similar. And I didn't even know this. I don't know about you, but I was like, this is news to me. How did I not know this? And when I looked up the earliest way that they wrote the word shalom to each other, what I found blew my mind. It blew my mind. Because you see, it's four symbols. And these four symbols put together literally define what God's peace is. So I'm going to share it up here with you. So we're going to put the word shalom on the screen. It looks like this. Now, back then they didn't read the same direction we do. So we're going to go right to left. So if you follow with me, we're going to start with this far symbol here. And it's animal teeth. And animal teeth stand for breaking. And then moving this direction, you have a shepherd's staff pointed down. It's as if a shepherd is hooking a sheep's neck and bringing the, the sheep to him. That stands for authority. The next symbol is a tent peg, which stands for attached to or established by. And that last symbol, it looks probably pretty obvious to a lot of us in this room. It's choppy waters, which stands for chaos. So if you're following along with me, the earliest way that the ancient Hebrews would write the word shalom to each other and how they would define it to each other because they're spelling it out, right? They're, they're painting a picture of what this word means with these symbols. It means this, God's peace is God breaking the authority established by or attached to chaos. Breaking the authority established by or attached to chaos. And I don't know about you, but that blew my mind because the earliest form of God's peace, shalom, and how they would write it to each other, they understood this. They understood that it's not about the circumstances we're facing in order to have peace. It has nothing to do with that, but everything to do with the authority that we give those chaotic circumstances in our life because we have a choice. We have a choice of who we follow. And we need to choose to surrender our chaotic circumstances, people, places, things in our life to God because we need to be under his authority. That thing that seems to be ruling our life, that diagnosis, that per toxic person, that hard situation, that relationship that's gone south, all those things are hard. And we've got to process through those emotions, but none of those things are supposed to be our authority. They are not meant to be our North Star. It's not meant to define our life. Only God can do that. Only God is meant to be our shepherd, and he is our good shepherd. 
and he will not lead us astray. And not only that, but he's with us through all of it. He says he will be with us no matter what we're facing. And as I was studying shalom, I came across a word I didn't even know existed that's very similar in some of the symbols they use, but has a very different meaning than the word shalom. And that's the word shalal, and it's S-H-A-L-A-L, shalal. And it actually uses some of the same symbols. It uses the authority symbol and the teeth symbol, and it means taking or seizing authority by destructive means. But it really has a, like a definition of spoiling. And as I was kind of learning about shalal, it made me think of some very familiar verses that you, you might be thinking of right now, and that's John 10.10, 10, where it says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I, and this is Jesus talking, I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, we have an enemy that doesn't want us to have God's peace. He wants to convince us that we have to live in shame, that we have to wait for X, Y, Z to happen before we can ever have God's peace. He wants to distract us. He wants to keep us busy and worn out and just lacking, right? The opposite of shalom. When shalom means wholeness, lacking nothing, shalom is lacking. And it's all about the authority, Okay, because it's someone, it's, it, it's, it's the enemy trying to seize authority, trying to gain space in our life by destructive means. And he's a very, very crafty enemy, but we have a God that is so much greater, so much greater. And he wants to bring us his peace. You know, I, I'm a big nerd, okay, <laughs> and I, I will admit it all day long, but I totally geek out when nature, God's creation, mimics God's concepts or things he's trying to help us understand. And if you're really looking for it, you'll see it all the time. And that's why we see this imagery in the Bible where it often talks about nature and and explaining things. And so um, recently, I guess about four years ago, I had a big birthday. We had a big anniversary. And my husband, Dave, was like, what, what do you want? What do you want for this? You know, what do you want for your birthday or what do you want for the anniversary? And I was like, I really just want a, a cool experience because I'm not really a big gift person, but I love experiences. Like, I'm like, let's go make a memory, you know? And so he's like, well, where do you want to go? And I was like, let's go someplace we can hike, like a really cool place we've never seen. And we ended up landing on Costa Rica, which is just beautiful, fairly easy to get to. Depending on where you go, it can be, you know, pretty inexpensive compared to some other places. And since we were going to hike, I was like, let's find a really cool place. So we went to the arm of Costa Rica where they have all these rainforests. And we found a place that was a volcanic rainforest. And I would equate it to like um, Yellowstone National Forest with a rainforest all put together. So you had like all this canopy of green trees and birds, spider monkeys, okay? Yes, spider monkeys who are strangely close to how my kids acted when they were younger. I used to tease them about it. I used to literally be like, stop acting like spider monkeys. And then I went to Costa Rica and was like, they really were in fact acting like spider monkeys. Like it's crazy how how kids can act like this, okay? Um, But you know, anyway, so we're seeing spider monkeys, but then you have like steam coming up from the ground. You have geysers. I mean, it's just the coolest thing. I'm like, I'm in Narnia, okay? And so Dave and I went and hiked two miles. We had this guide with us. He's pointing out all the different biodiversity, the plants and the birds and the animals. It's just so cool. And I kept on seeing this one tree that he never explained what it was. And so I stopped him and I said, can you tell me what this tree is? And I'm gonna show you a picture of it up here. So I kept on seeing this tree and it had this really gnarly root system and then like a skirt around the bottom, but it goes way higher than I could even capture in the picture. And it was just really something to see. And he, when I asked him about it, his eyes lit up and he goes, I'm so glad you asked me about this tree because it's kind of a freak of nature. And I was like, freak of nature, tell me more, you know? Again, I geek out on this stuff. So anyway, he was like, oh, it's called the strangler tree, the strangler tree. And he said, and scientists refer to what the strangler tree does as nature's unwanted hug. You can look this up. It's really cool. And I was like, nature's unwanted hug. Why does it, why is it called that? And he said, well, here's what happens. The strangler tree forms a root system next to a healthy host tree that has good light source, good nutrients, good water, and good air. And literally it's like, hey neighbor, can I just give you a hug? I'm not trying to be creepy. Just want to give you a little hug. I'm just affectionate. Can I also borrow some of your water? Maybe a little bit of your sunlight, just a little. Some of your nutrients. I'm just sharing good neighbors. Share, come on. And like, just acts like it's harmless. Just 
growing up next to it, right? That's what it, it wants to convince this host tree of. But it starts to hug this host tree and then slowly but surely wraps around and around and around and around and around that host tree. Before the host tree even realizes it, it's formed a, literally like a fortress around the host tree. And it starts choking it, choking the very life out of that host tree to the point where it has no more sunlight, no more water, no more nutrients, and no air to even survive. And as he's telling me this, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like so savage. Nature's crazy, right? But really, as he's telling me this, all I could think about was John 10.10. The thief, the enemy, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That shalal, that strangler tree was literally a picture of shalal and of the enemy's aim on our life. But the thing that I kept on thinking as well was that we don't have to be like that host tree. You see, we have a good shepherd. We have a father that the minute we cry out to him, the minute we say, Lord, reveal the strangler trees in my life, because see, sometimes strangler trees in our life, they're not some creepy root system, but they look like sin. They look like bad habits that turn into full-fledged sin. They look like circumstances that just come our way because we live in a broken world where Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It looks like people that we're trying to have peace with that don't want to have peace with us. Those are strangler trees in our life. But we don't have to be like that host tree who ends up being choked out because we cry out to God and say, God, this is yours. Like I surrender these burdens, these worries, these things that are weighing me down and choking me out to you. Will you rescue me, Lord? Bring me your peace. And it's as, as if he comes in like, and he just cuts off that root system of that strangler tree and brings us to him. The minute that we cry out to him, he wants to bring us his peace. And it's as if he's telling the enemy, stop messing with my kids. Stop messing with them because I want to give them peace. I want to give them life to the fullest. But it takes us asking for him to reveal the strangler trees, which is kind of a, sometimes an awkward prayer, but it's an important one because we all have them. Sometimes they're blind spots too that we're like, we don't even know. Like we didn't even realize that was becoming such a, such a thing in our life that was choking the life out of us. So we got to pray that prayer like, Lord, reveal. I search my heart, God, right? Search my heart and reveal these to me. Because peace is there for the taking, but we, we have to play our part in this. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit we must pursue, promote, and protect in our heart and in our home. And how do we pursue it? We do what you're doing right now. We come to church. We get around believers. We worship. We read the Bible. We, we have Bible studies. We have small groups. We serve in the community. We exercise our faith. We make sure that we're staying close to Jesus, right? That's how we pursue peace. The closer we get to him, the more peace we'll have in our life. So it takes us taking those actions. I love in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it says, don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring all your requests to God and your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. I love how it mentions in this that not only do we just bring, you know, we bring all of our cares, everything that's going on, all of our prayers to him, but we do it with giving thanks, I believe that's the difference maker and that's how we have more peace is that even when we're going through like the roughest time in our life, when we do bring it to God, we say, Lord, thank you for being here for me. And Lord, I don't love these circumstances, but I'm gonna thank you for them in advance because I know you're not gonna waste it because I know that you use everything not only for my good, but for your glory. And I may not see it on this side of heaven. I may, I mean, I may know what it was for, but a lot of times we don't, but we can trust him. We can trust him in the process as we pursue peace. And we pursue peace when we fully surrender our heart and mind to him. And that means that it's a daily, sometimes minute by minute thing. It takes us really going to him and saying, I need your help. You know, all this morning in worship and through the prayers, that's what they're talking about. They're saying all of us are sinners in need of a savior. We need Jesus desperately. And we pursue his peace when we recognize that and we ask for his help. I love in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Because we promote peace when we are kind and encouraging, 
and work to establish healthy boundaries. You know, we're called to be peacemakers, but I think sometimes we tend to, like we're, we're trying to have peace with someone and maybe they take advantage of it and that, that peacemaker be, ends up being a doormat, right? God calls us to be peacemakers. It says as far as it depends upon us, upon you and me, what we personally can do to be at peace with someone, let's do that. That means we pray for them. We put out that olive branch, right? But if they are the kind of person who wants to control your life, almost to be like God in your life, constantly just trying to have their will for your life and not God's, that's out of bounds, right? And it's out of balance. And that's not what God calls us to. In those scenarios where they're trying to take up too much space, trying to control you, the most loving thing you can do is put boundaries in place. And they're gonna resist. If there's been someone who's used to having control in your life and all of a sudden you're like, I'm trying to have peace in my life and God is my authority, I need to put boundaries in place, they're not gonna love it. They're naturally not gonna love it. But that doesn't mean that we don't stay the course. Because you can say, listen, because I love you, I wanna have a relationship with you that's healthy, so I'm gonna put these boundaries in place and I'm gonna trust God with the rest. So just, we, we, we need to have these boundaries. And that way we can really have a healthy relationship. And you can also both have more peace in your life. It's a really important concept to do that. I've had to learn this the hard way, but I'm telling you, it's so much better having healthy boundaries. We all need healthy boundaries. It's an important part of life. We protect the peace in our heart and our home by choosing to trust God, especially in the hard seasons. You see, when it comes to having more peace in our life, I think this is where most of us feel the rub. This is where most of us are like, I don't know. I mean, like when the world seems to be falling apart, when we're like, every choice I have here is not a good one. Like, what do we do with that? Do we just throw up our hands and think, well, I guess most people might be able to have peace, but I I just can't. Because that's what the enemy wants us to believe. He wants us to hide in shame. He wants us to not get help. Because, you know, when we bring our burdens to the light, that's where God can do his greatest work. But when we try to hide in the shadows and let Satan mess with us, that's where we're just kept, we're kept like in that strangler tree, just like that host tree. And we slowly are like choking to death. It's like we can't even breathe. And y'all, I was there. Like years ago, I went through a four-year battle with anxiety and depression. I didn't really know what it was at first. And, and I was kind of ashamed. Like I, I thought, oh, I'm not believing hard enough. I must have done something seriously wrong to feel this way as a Christian. I mean, maybe I'm not really saved. Like all those horrible like lies from the enemy. Like what's going on? Why am I having this? I shouldn't be having this. And I just kept on creeping back into the shadow. I was a young married woman. I know my husband knew something was wrong, but it's like I couldn't even tell him. I, I was scared of my own thoughts. And then I would have these anxiety attacks where I felt like my heart was gonna beat out of my chest. I couldn't breathe. I literally could not get a full breath. And then there would be toiling in my stomach and I would sometimes have to run to the bathroom and I was becoming physically ill. See, a lot of people don't realize mental illness, yes, it's in our mind, but it affects our entire body, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically. And I was a mess. But you know, every time I cried out to the Lord, even if it was on the bathroom floor and I'm sweaty after having an anxiety attack and getting sick, He'd meet me right, right there. He's close to the brokenhearted. He helps the weary. In our weakness, we are strong. And he gives us peace, just enough that we need at that time. Peace for each day. And it was like each day, whenever I would surrender it all to the Lord, my anxiety, my depression, all the confusion that was going on in my mind, he would calm me. You know, years ago, We, uh, you know, our kids, I can't remember all of the ages, but I know this guy right here, Connor, he's 16 now. He's about eight years old. And he came running into our family room and he was like, mom and dad, mom and dad. We're like, what, 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 what's going on? He said, I need you to come to our back screened in porch. We had this little screened in porch that had a lot of flowering plants around it. And we loved to watch the bumblebees doing their work. And then there'd be hummingbirds that would come. Well, for some reason, I guess the door had gotten left open and a hummingbird had gotten trapped in our screened in porch. And this hummingbird was up high in our screened in porch and frantically flying back and forth and was so scared that he was hitting himself against the walls. And Connor had tried to help him like see the door was open this whole time, but it's like he couldn't see it. And so Connor's like, we gotta help him, we gotta help him. And so first we start like, go out, you know, like we're doing like 
like thinking it can, like a traffic control person, you know, and the bird is just freaked out. Like the giants are coming to get me. Okay. And so like that didn't work. So then Dave's like, let's get a broom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're going to really freak this little thing out. Cause Connor's like, his heart's going to beat out of his chest or he's going to knock himself out on the wall. We got to do something. Dave's like, I'll get a broom. So he gets this broom thinking he could like lower him somehow. And he starts flying even more frantic. So then Dave gets a bag and he's like, I'll just bag him up. And that just freaks out the bird. And Dave's about falling off the stool, trying to bag this bird. We can't get him. And then we're like, oh, hummingbirds like nectar. Let's get nectar. And so we're like, we get the nectar on the stool and we're like, come down. There's nectar, you know, and he doesn't want to come down. So then I literally put my fingers in the nectar and I flick him with it. I'm like, we're nice. It's nectar. Just come on down, you know. And anyway, it's like nothing was working. So all of a sudden, Connor, eight-year-old Connor, is like, hold on, I'll be right back. He runs up to his room, runs back down, and he has a super soaker water gun. I don't know if you all remember what those are. Huge water gun. It can have like a continuous water stream. You know, you usually get your friends with it, right? And, and we're like, okay, I don't know what's going on here, dude, but this, I don't think this is going to work. And he's like, no, no, hear me out. You know how when I run in the sprinkler with my clothes on, how when I get weighed down by the water, I can't run as fast. And when I try to go jump on the trampoline, I can't jump as high. It slows me down. And he goes, what if I shoot this bird with that stream of water and I weigh him down to the point where he slows down and he can see the open door and he'll fly out. And literally we're like, our child is a genius. Okay, it's literally what we thought. And then, but then we're like doubtful. We're like, we've tried everything. It can't be that simple. It can't be that simple, right? But we're like, Connor, have a go. We've tried everything. And so Connor, like a master marksman, gets that super soaker, hits that bird with a constant stream. And at first the bird is freaking out like, oh my gosh, now the giants wanna drown me. Like what is going on with this family? And so anyway, he's frantically doing his, his, his wings and he's so nervous. But then as more water gets on him, he starts slowing down. And then all of a sudden he starts going to the ground and he hits the ground, looks right and left and sees the open door, shakes off the water and flies out of there as fast as he can. It worked. Why am I sharing this with you? I think so many times why we don't have peace is we're the hummingbird who finds ourselves in a new place, whether it's physically a new place or emotionally a new place, and we don't like what we're seeing. It's new, we don't know it. We're like, God, how could you let me go through this? Why are you letting me be in this room right now? Why are you letting me be around these people? How could you let these things happen, God? And then we start frantically getting nervous. We don't trust Him. We're like, God, where are you? Where are you? I don't see the way out. And our heart's beating out of our chest and we don't know where to go when there's a way out the whole time. You see, in the, in the Word, it talks about how God will never let us go through something that He won't be right there with us and provide the way out. But I think we need, we need to sometimes just allow His living water to wash over us and slow us down long enough to realize where we are, to get our bearings, to know He is still with us and He is still in the business of giving us peace and that He has provided the way so that we can realize it because sometimes we're just so busy and distracted and worn out that we are missing it. We don't see it, but we need to trust Him enough to slow down and let His peace wash over us because that's the kind of peace He wants us to have. Because when we trust God with the pieces, those pieces of our life that are like little puzzle pieces that don't quite fit together, that's where we'll find His peace. That's where His peace is. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much that you are a God who created peace for us, to give us peace in all circumstances, Lord, not just the calm circumstances, but in the hard circumstances, in the chaotic circumstances, in times when things don't make sense, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you search all of our hearts, reveal the strangler trees to us, Lord. Help us to do our part to pursue, promote, and protect the peace in our hearts and homes, Lord. And for those that don't know you, Lord, that don't yet know you, I pray, Lord, today that they choose to follow you. They start reading about you. They come to this church week after week and learn about you, Lord. They get around like-minded believers, Lord, and start to experience what it's like to walk with Jesus, the path towards peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.